So welcome to Beauty of Colors podcast, Brian. It's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So tell the listeners a little bit about you and what inspired you to write your book. Um, so I am I'm not retired military yet. I'm still active duty. But uh, what inspired me to write the book was it was uh, I always tell people it wasn't that I wanted to write a book. I didn't want to. Um, I just felt the need. To. Um, and the reason is that I had a lot of crazy experiences, which we all have. Right. Everybody has crazy experiences. Um, some of us learn from them, some of us don't. And some of us learn because we're forced to, and some of us learn because I'm, I fall into that category often, like I'm forced to learn. But, but because of those crazy experiences, as luck, fortune, the universe would have it, whatever you want to call it, um, I realized that I had been implementing some techniques that allowed me to be resilient when faced with pretty significant trauma. And actually come out of it with growth versus the damage that a lot of people, unfortunately, feel or experience from the same type of stimulus. As I started to notice that, you know, with uh, peers and whatnot, that not everybody was coming out of this thing better or the same, or, you know, any, any, well, a lot, many were coming out way worse. And even some, you know, take their own lives because of the same stimulus. And that really caused me to look inside and talk with a lot of mental health um, professionals to kind of identify why that would be. And that's what made me feel like I needed to share. We, we did identify some things. And I was like, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't know that was happening. I didn't know it would have these kind of effects. I bet most people don't. And so let's, let's get it out there. And at first, it was supposed to be just for military. That's what I was really focused on. But after I really started getting into it, you know, pain is pain, trauma is trauma, life is life, right? Like, so how our body processes trauma is the same whether we are a mother in a grocery store that has something happen or we're taking fire from the Taliban. Like, our brain and how we're prepared for that, um, there's a lot of similarity. So the book ends up being for pretty much anybody because one in three people are going to experience a significant trauma in their life, that means that either we're going to have it or someone we care about is going to have it. So that's what, that's what drove me. That's what really said, hey, I need to do this. Well, I forgot to say thank you for your service. I should have said that from the beginning. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Okay. So how would readers um, who never been in combat, who've never been in Afghanistan, how would they be able to relate to your book? So. Well, first, I would say so the, the, the title of my book is Clear Thought, and I picked that title. Um, it's a military term, right? It's a military term that says you've met all the criteria to proceed and take a significant action. In the military, it means you're going you're gonna to shoot that thing, right? Well, you don't want to shoot the wrong things, and you don't want to go in the wrong direction. Right? You want to make sure that you've done everything you can to affect the result that you're trying to affect. So the ideas and the principles that I teach are are that are are there to enable us to be clear thought on our life. Now, whether that's in the military or whether that's in uh, just regular life, the principles apply. They just they, they they apply all across the board. And you know what holds people back from doing certain things in regular life, um, things experiences that they've had that holds them back or things that they're afraid of, that is not any different than, than what holds often holds people back in, in those extreme situations as well, in you know, range and combat. So there's a lot of applicability. Like some of the principles, uh, you know, what like one of the principles is just like something as simple as how to build a, a, a positive perspective. Now, that, obviously, that goes across all boards, and that's very cliche. We hear that, oh, yeah, be positive, yeah, yeah. Of course, that, that that's that's a dumb moment. But we kind of go into how you can do that and some techniques that would help you get there. Um, there's, I, you know, there's we, we identified seven principles and we break through it down each of those. And if you break them down, they apply to, you know, whoever's sitting in front of you, really. So I don't know if I answered your question on that. Do you have a specific, like, I can give you the principles and then we can maybe talk from there. Like um, the, the seven that we 
that we talked about where one was grow a healthy perspective another was practice chair flying that one probably stands out to people like what the heck is that because it sounds kind of like a harry potter movie but it's not and value a high, the importance of valuing a higher cause build build how to build a, a, the importance of building a healthy support system you avoid festering emotional wounds releasing hate define and embrace honorable missions if you if you just take that list it's not military right that isn't military that is just good life advice mm -hmm. and a lot of it we've heard but what i do is i take my military experiences which are extreme mm -hmm. and kind of teach how they how how i implemented these things that seem pretty basic but they're not right they're basic but you to build a habit of fostering a, a healthy perspective that's not basic because if it was basic we'd all do it mm -hmm. right? it would all be automatic but it isn't you know it's something that's just like learning how to bench press 220 pounds if you start at 120 it's going to take a little while it's going to take some work you're gonna to have to foster a habit but there are practices and techniques that we can you do to do exactly that get us to that point where having that positive uh, uh mental perspective is automatic or do any of those principles or those things that you would you know, do any of those principles relate to the question you're asking or is there a question that comes from anyone no, actually, um, what you're saying is that anybody can apply those seven principles to, into their life. That's what you're saying. It doesn't have to be, you have to be in the AMI. Anybody can do that for a positive um, life. Is that what you're saying? 100%. Yes, that's okay. exactly what I'm saying. Okay. So it's all about discipline too, because you, you want to be disciplined in order to follow those practices. Yeah, and you have to know kind of like, how do I practice that? I mean, like a lot of, if you just ask somebody, how do you, how do you grow the ability to have a healthy perspective? I don't think very many people would, would say, well, I'll just try harder. Well, that's, yes, <laughs> that's true of everything. But if you have a system in place that helps you keep, keep, helps keep you honest, helps keep you accountable, and then eventually it does become automatic. That's interesting. So yeah, there's, there's discipline involved. Um, but it, the idea is you, you execute the discipline up front. And with time, it's just a, it just becomes part of who you are, integrated into your person um, okay. and the time of life. Sounds good. And what's the, could you say the name of your book again? Because it were, you were not too clear in the, in the beginning. I'm sorry, Cleared Hot. Cleared okay. Hot. Okay. And, and, and it's on, I have, there's a webpage. It's www.cleardhot.info, mm -hmm. not, not, not com, dot info. So cleardhot.info, all word, all one word. How did the beginning of your marriage affect your mindset as you were in Afghanistan? So my marriage was, uh, it's, it's something that I talk about with, uh, quite a bit in the book because my marriage, I'd only been married for five months uh, when I deployed for what ended up being about three months um, total. Because we had a training spin up that was actually in Texas, so it's not really in Afghanistan. So that was like eight months, and then we went to Afghanistan for over a year. But it was back to back. So we were married for five months and then separated for you know almost almost two years. And she she was later diagnosed. We realized we didn't know this at the time, but she had borderline personality disorder, right? And so there was definitely this. Uh, I mean, your question is how did that marriage my marriage how did it affect my marriage or how does my marriage affect uh, the the deployment? And those are both great questions. Um, it was very difficult. <laughs> it's what it was. Often I realized that the relationship, um, the unknowns of the relationship and, and those things were more, more impactful than the unknowns of the enemy, right? The enemy shooting at me and doing these other things, I was more prepared and more trained to handle that than I was with the unknowns of a, a relationship that was with a, somebody who was struggling with a mental illness that I didn't even understand the mental illness. So, you know, it's like, you know, uh, like kids trying to be doctors, right? <laughs> Let's put some leaves on the wound, you know, that'll, that'll fix it. Um, that's kind of the approach I was doing was like the, the school of school of try, try something, see if it works. But, um, and I didn't, I wasn't into, you know, counseling or therapy. I was, you know, I was that typical guy's guy, suck it up, drive on, blah, 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 right? But through this process, I was like, oh, I've I had professionals teach me how to fly in combat. I need a professional to teach me how to fly in my marriage. Like I need a professional to teach me how to navigate the intricacies of something that I just don't understand, right? And so that is uh, a, 
a part of the book throughout the book is dealing with the war in front of you and the war that you left behind or you're creating in the background. That's that's very interesting. So you kind of took some of the principles you learned in Texas and when you went to Afghanistan and you applied this into your marriage to make it work? Well, Texas was just, just a military trainer, right? Oh, okay. So that was preparing me for the war, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't preparing me for my relationship. And oh. that's really what I found while I was gone. I was like, you know, most people would be like, how do you handle, you know, Taliban throwing an RPG at you? I was like, well, like this, because they train me how to do it. How do you handle your your wife throwing an RPG at you? Not a real RPG, obviously, but like, or, you know, an explosive uh, interaction or what? And that was where I realized, ooh, I don't have the training I need for this. And what I've realized since is some of the lessons that I was applying for combat did apply in that relationship. I just wasn't open to it at the time. I wasn't open to um, chair flying, if you will, which is basically the art of, uh, I, I always tell people it's like if, if uh, meditation and visualization and role play had a love child, it would be chair flying. That's that action, right? So I would do that those that practice. Which there's more on that on my website too of how that breaks down. Mm -hmm. But I would do that for combat. The example I usually give is like so. There's one time we we're flying and and we we're and it was dark. It was really dark at night. Really really dark at night. And so in the in the Apache helicopter you have a forward looking infrared, which basically allows you to see in the dark. It's dark green. Uh, a dark green environment is what you end up seeing, but you only see it in one eye. You see it in your right eye because there's a little monocle that goes over your right eye. Your left eye is open to the environment and the inside of the cockpit. So my left eye is completely black because it's dark and we're engaging uh, an enemy compound. So my right eye can see what we're doing. We engage that compound and it goes away. You know, it turns it, it turns from a compound into a dust and that's why we're engaging it. And then all of a sudden my right eye goes dark too. It was black. So there is no, I can't see anything. Not only does my right eye go black, but the cockpit lights inside the aircraft, they go black. And the and the sound inside of my ear cups um, goes away. So there's no radio. So all of the, the information I'm getting from different areas just went away. The only thing I have now are the controls of the helicopter in my hands and pitch black in front of me. And, and I'm like, ooh, you know, so what, what do I do here? I have um, my vision goggles that are on my dash, which I put, you have to attach to your hat, your helmet, <laughs> attach to your helmet, and then you put those down and then you can see in the dark again. Uh, but I still didn't have radios, I still didn't have instruments, I still didn't have a navigation system. So as soon as I was able to see, I made sure there's still some air between us and the helicopter, and then I started to break away from the enemy fight, knowing that my wingman would follow me. And then I signaled to him with a flashlight, you know, because I don't have a radio. I just did a you know, flashlight so he knew that something was wrong, which he knew. And I came up, he came up beside me, and then I, I tucked in on him when we went home. Okay. Why do I share that story? I share that story because that was a crazy event that was able to I was able to navigate because I had I had mentally prepared myself for that scenario before. I did I had exercised what I call chair flying. I set myself in a good learning state by meditation. I had visualized these type of scenarios and how I would react. How and you know as as down to the down to the degree of take a deep breath, calm down, analyze the situation. You're gonna have nothing. You, like you lose your you lose your vision, you have an alternate vision that's not on that helicopter power, that's on the dash. You're gonna put that on. Then you're gonna have to communicate in a way that you can't communicate normally. So I'm gonna use a flash, right? And then we're gonna point towards the area of safety as best I know and know that and trust in my team to do what they're gonna do. I walked myself through those type of scenarios over and over again until I felt comfortable with them. And then when they actually happened, it wasn't the first time they happened. And so something that would have actually very likely ended up in a crash, it's just a cool story, right? But we can do those same things with our life, right? We can do those same step type of steps with our life. And the cool part about the chair flying is that I learned after the deployment is not only was I preparing myself for real world emergency, I was preparing my mind to be resilient to trauma. It's called stress inoculation, right? So when we inoculate ourselves from a medical, like you get a weakened dose of a virus or whatever it is, and we inoculate ourselves, then when the real thing happens, it doesn't hurt us as bad. It may not even hurt us at all. You know, we may not even notice, right? 
I did the same thing with that situation. It happened. Now it's a cool story. But it, if I wouldn't have inoculated myself, maybe we crash. Maybe we don't. Maybe we get through it. But even if I did, we get we got through it. Maybe it hurts me mentally. Maybe it 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 there's traumatizing. But because I had inoculated myself from that ahead of time, it didn't. And and that is something we can apply in all walks of life. You're in a marriage, and you're having you have to have a difficult a difficult conversation. And as human beings, we know that we don't always react well to difficult difficult conversations. So you chair fly that thing. You get your mind in the right place. You walk through how you think it's going to go, and then you walk through how it would go if there's a variable. Like, what if she does this? Well, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to overreact. I'm not going to yell back. I'm not going to do this. and do something that would de-escalate that. And you walk through it so you've been there before. And if you've been there before, it's smoother when it happens and it doesn't affect your psyche or your emotional health, well-being to the extent as it would have if you weren't prepared. Mm-hmm. That's one of the principles. I'm going to go into way more detail on how to do that. You know, there's it's it's more detailed than just meditate. You know, we go into how to do that. But but it applies to everything. What I'm getting from you is that you want to be prepared. It's all about preparation. Well, it, it's about creating a better you, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of that has to do with preparation. A lot of that has to do with learning new skills. A lot of that learns has to do with creating habits. Um, and each of these principles, you know, there's a buildup to them, right? You don't just do it. You have to learn how to do it. And then, then the result is a better you, a better result. Mm-hmm. Where trauma isn't something that create that 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 is trans that it, it transforms trauma from something that's a current obstacle to something that is now foundational to a better version of you. Right? So, do you feel that the absence of your communication um, in your marriage negatively affected your mental health the longer you stayed in Afghanistan? Um, it. That's a really good question. Yes. I mean, short answer, yes. It, it, it became harder and harder to separate those two ones, right? At, at first, I had them pretty well separated. One of them, I felt like I was pretty well trained for the military. The other one, I wasn't really well trained for. And because of that, it started to leach and bleed into the one that I was prepared. How often in our lives does that happen, right? Things that we're good at, things that were like our job or whatever, or even hobbies, we're good at those. And, and we're, we may excel in those things and people see that we excel in those things. And then we have this other thing that's going on in the background that we don't know how to deal with. And we may compartmentalize it, we may stuff it down, we may do different things, but if we don't figure out how to deal with it, if we don't face that, it will leach over and affect, eventually affect even the things that we are. And so that did start to happen. I, I even would say that in the book. At first, I didn't. Have, she was never in my mind during while I was in the helicopter. And I was engaging the enemy. She was never, she didn't pop in. It was, it was like, I'm on here. I'm doing this. I'm not thinking that. Towards the end of the book, I was like, it was an effort. I'm like, okay, push it back out. She's popping into my mind, right? So to answer your question, yeah, it can grow and gain its own momentum in a bad way. But just in a bad way, it's like, just like it can in a bad way. If you start implementing these other things, you can gain momentum in a good way. So, so you said that you got married. Five months into your marriage, you moved to Texas for training, and then you went to Afghanistan. So what was the biggest challenge once you arrived in Afghanistan? <laughs> the biggest. Uh, yeah, I mean, the line is long, but it's not distinguished. Um, I, the biggest, I mean, initially, the biggest challenge was the unknown. I, I didn't know whether it was with my relationship or it was with the, the enemy. I didn't know what I didn't know, and that unknown would create an uneasiness inside me, right? Um, and that's where that chair flying did come into practice, at least on the mission side. It started to create a comfortability, is that a word? <laughs> a comfort with, uh, with, with the unknown. Like I made it known by, by doing the chair flying through it. I didn't do that so much with the relationship because I just didn't think to do that. And, and as such, it became more comfortable with combat and less and less comfortable with the relationship. So yeah, I would say the biggest challenge was the unknown in both arena. How do you how did you adjust to the 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 violence, the consistent violence in um, that were occurring around you in um, Afghanistan? How did you adjust to that? Well, that was the question I asked myself when I got back because I was like I, I made it through the year of and there was a lot of violence. 
I mean, there were, and a lot of it at my at my fingertips, right? Because that was my game, right? And it, it, it and it hadn't negatively impacted me like it did a lot of other guys. And I actually went to mental health people and said, "Am I a psychopath? Why is it not bothering me?" And they're like, "If you're worried about being a psychopath, what I what we really went back to is once again, it was that practice of truth lying. I I visualized taking lives uh, because that was I knew that was a finality or an actuality of what I was going to have to do. I visualized that and I visualized how I would react to that and how I would categorize that. It's not good for their families. <laughs> That of those people, it's not good for the, the the community. It's not good for me. It, it it's just it's the ugliness of war that we had to acknowledge was a reality. Is that any different than the? Is that any different than you know living on a rough street and seeing things? Is that any different than being in a grocery store and witnessing something? It is the ugliness that is a reality. So. We we don't in, we don't run towards ugliness necessarily, but we understand that it is it is something we're going through, right? In some way, shape. So I I how did I deal with it? I I acknowledge that it's real. I acknowledge that it's something that is going to happen, and I'm going to be part of it just because of the nature of war. War is ugly, and as as ugly, I'm part of the ugly. But I don't have to be ugly, right? I don't have to be ugly inside. I. One of the one of the principles was release hate, right? Mm-hmm. The best way to release hate is never get it to begin with, which I never really had hate for the enemy. In fact, I had a lot of respect in a lot of ways. Those people have been fighting since the year 708. You can be in the ugly, but not of the ugly. That that is so true. So when when you got back home, I know your life was different. Being in Afghanistan for so long, getting back, did you did you see that? things were falling into place or were you, when you got home, were you still thinking that you're still in Afghanistan? I mean, everybody has, I think, I, if I'm being honest, I think everybody's going to have a little bit of a residual effect from those type of experiences. Um, I didn't think I was still in Afghanistan, but, you know, just little things would that I had to deal with was like, uh, even the things as simple as a loud noise, right? Mm-hmm. A loud noise might make make everybody in the in the room jump. But the impact of that loud noise as far as like what you're putting behind it um, is is different, right? So when I was here and here's a here's a story. I was flying uh, like we call it night water, the night water mission. And uh, and this was at Lake Mead in just outside of Nevada, right? So this is not at war. Mm-hmm. But I had been to war and I'd experienced war quite a bit. And we had a mud duck go through the center of our windscreen. Boom, right through the really loud noise. I didn't see it because it was dark, right? Mm-hmm. I heard it. I felt it. And my initial my initial call out was we're taking fire, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean technically yes, we're taking fire at the bird, but um but like the the engineer in, in the back, because this is I wasn't flying Apaches before I was flying the rescue helicopters. Well there's more people in the helicopter. The engineer in the back said, it's a comp- compressor stall, right? Because they make that kind of noise too. And that, you know, I was like, immediately, I was like, well, that makes more sense. <laughs> of course, that makes more sense. It wasn't a compressor stall either, right? It was a duck coming through the middle of the windscreen, mm-hmm. which when I flashed the light up, I could feel the wind on my face. So I, I flashed the, the light up on there and, uh, and saw that there's basically blood and guts and everything all through the middle of the aircraft. I was like, oh, we took. We took a bird through the center one screen. So did it did it react? Did it cause you know those kind of things? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, probably even a I would say there was a little bit of a shortness of temper too, because it's just a last lack of patience. Um, but I, if I may, I I wrote a poem in the book that that is that describes this. And if you're okay with it, I'll read it. Oh yeah, fine. Go ahead. I would love that. I think the listeners would love to hear your poem. Go ahead. Okay. It's called Permanent Revision, right? Um, And here it goes. Um, You can imagine a war. You can imagine a fight. No matter what is imagined, you will not be right. I remember well the feeling that day when I saw two planes take two towers. A pit in my stomach began to grow. I have to do something, but what? I didn't know. I long to be part of the retaliatory attack. I want my brothers in arms to know I've got their back. Already in service of arms to defend this country I love, if need be, to bitter end. You can imagine a war. You can imagine a fight. No matter what is imagined, you will not be right. 
but on the sideline, I sit and wait. My turn's still not near. To hunt down those who attack my nation here. Go back to school. Your time will come, son. I don't want to, f- I don't want to turn, rather towards the fire. Finish my school, lethal craft learned, ever more anxious, feeling my turn I have earned. You can imagine a war. You can imagine a fight. No matter what is imagined, you will not be right. Finally, the day came for boots on the ground of a country lost. Now two villains is bound. The fight is real, so we practice and plan. Destruction and death fill Afghanistan. We do our job, pushing fear aside. Looking war in the face is a point of pride. You can imagine a war. You can imagine a fight. No matter what you imagine, you will not be right. Not what I thought or imagined indeed. Fighting for people who have so much need. Evil fills caverns, so the rest they must suffer. Can't imagine... (laughs) Sorry. Can't imagine a place making men any tougher. You can, <clears throat> sorry, get a little emotional sometimes. You fight not for country, for flag, or great seal. You fight for your brothers and always will. You can imagine a war. You can imagine a fight. No matter what is imagined, you will not be right. At last, we're back home in the land of the free. I may look the same, but I'm a new me. Things seen and deeds done now bound to my soul in the sum of the parts that now make up my whole. Using the ugly to strengthen and teach, helping my brothers, the ones I can reach. Reality so far from what the mind will envision, once experienced the brain's tattooed with permanent revision. You can imagine a war, you can imagine a fight. No matter what you imagine, you will not be right. That's deep, Brian. Yeah, and I think that paints the picture to answer the question that you said. Yes, you're changed. You are changed. And you can't hide from that. You have to embrace it. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful poem. What, what, is, what is the biggest advice you would give to soldiers um, once returning to their normal lives? And I think the poem says it all, but what big advice would you tell soldiers that are returning? I think basically what I, I just said is, is you, you have to embrace the fact that you have to. You are a new version of you. Now that doesn't have to derail you, right? That can, ju- that can be embraced and you can find strength within those changes. You can use those things as foundational pieces instead of, you know, um, obstacles or, or blockades to a better view. Like, it's just a matter of perspective on where you put this, how you categorize them, how you file them. Right? But to, to expect yourself to be who you were before is an unrealistic expectation. You've changed. You've evolved. Now, the, you've evolved or you've evolved. The question is, which one are you going to do? Are you going to make it an evolution or are you going to make it a de-evolution? De- and, and, and the people that do devolve, not bad people. They just haven't figured out their recipe, right? Mm-hmm. And, they, and, and they're and they confused. Why am I Why am who I am right now? Why am I not who I know to be? And that's why I say you have to embrace the new. And you have, to, you have to embrace the ugly you were part of, but not that you are that ugly, right? Like I said, you can be in the ugly, uh, and that has to be a separation. Of things to me. That's powerful. So where can the listeners get a copy of your book? They can go to www.clearhot.info, or they can go to um, uh, just Amazon. After October 18th, it, it'll be on Amazon. If it's before, they can go pre-order uh, on both the website and Amazon. Okay, sounds good. So what words of encouragement would you give to the listeners? Um, if somebody wants to get into the army, is there any words of encouragement to tell them, you know, do they really want to get into the army or do they really don't want to get into the army? So is there some positive encouragement? Well, the, the one thing I would say is, so I've experienced all this stuff and I'm so grateful. Right? So um, in that sense, I, I wouldn't change it though. I, I, I've seen, yes, there was some stuff that, I'm, that happened that, you know, if I chose, if I said, I, well, whether I would do this or do that, I would choose not to. But because you're in that situation, you deal with it and you have it, but you can grow from it. So getting into the Army, one of the things is define and embrace honorable missions. If you understand what your mission is, I think it is a very honorable right, to get in there and, and, and be part of, of a greater cause. But you have to understand what comes with it. And, and you can prepare your mind. You can do the, the you know, like, there's lots of things, not just my book. There's lots of things out there, but like in the version in my book is the terrible. You can start to prepare your mind to fortify it against, right? And I would encourage anybody that's doing, getting into the, the profession of arms or 
first responder, those are, you're much more likely to see those kind of things. You know what's going on. So start that way, right? So that it, it's so much easier to prevent than to heal, right? Um, now you can heal too. Right? And that's what we found is these same steps work with healing. But it's like if you avoided breaking your leg versus breaking, you know, if you break your leg, you can still heal. You're going to put a you know, cast, you're going to have some pain, you're going to have to walk through. And it may never feel exactly the same, mm-hmm. right? And they, it may always feel a little bit different. You can heal. But if you if you just avoid breaking your leg to begin with, your leg's going to feel, you know, you're not going to have to go through that as much. So that was great words of encouragement, um, Brian. So the book, is it you, the, the sole author, or is there another person? So I teamed up with an uh, an established author. His name, his name is Michael Hirsch. He's written some military memoirs before. He's also written. He's actually written fiction. He's written a couple different books. But yeah, I I realized you know I'm not a writer. And I am now. <laughs> so are we expecting a second book from you, M. Brian? Um, <laughs> it depends on how well this does. Like so, when I was in the army, I flew the Apache, and then I immediately transitioned over to the Air Force. Mm-hmm. through combat search and rescue and so i ended up to flying rescue missions in many of the same places i was blowing things up as a helicopter and there really is kind of like a full circle there because part of the things you have to come to terms with as an attack pilot is that there is some collateral damage these people fight with their families in and around their families and mm-hmm. sometimes kids and women are going to get killed and that's horrific but as a as a rescue pilot we get called in often to pick up a kid that had shrapnel in one of our attacks or things like that. And, you know, it was very, very powerful. You're like, well, we're still ugly. I'm still in the ugly. This is full circle. I was doing our job when I was causing these goals. I'm doing my job still when we're picking up uh, and doing them to safety. So, so it was, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely another book there if, uh, if this one does well. <laughs> Okay, so so you're still in the army. I'm actually Air Force, so I, I was Army. Okay. I transitioned to Air Force. Okay. Uh, at the end, I, so the deployment that is covered in this book is Army. Then I tra- then I transferred over to the Air Force, and I fly combat search and rescue. And I am still in. I will actually be dropping my retirement papers in March, mm-hmm. and uh, and, uh, and that that's I want to go out and help people with this message. That's why I'm doing this now. So if any of your listeners or Anybody else, uh, I, I do speaking engagements for this kind of thing to try to help people. Uh, with these. I'm, I'm a better person based off of the things that I used. For me, it was just luck. I didn't know. I didn't know that, that they were the result of that. But if I can get these things to other people and they can do it with purpose, even they probably end up better than me. Yeah. Not that I'm saying I'm amazing, but like better in a better situation. Sounds excellent, Brian. This podcast, Beauty of Colors, is all about inspiration and helping people along their journey in life. So that's that's a great story. And I hope people flock to Amazon and pre-order your books and um, check out your website. Is there anything that you would like to leave with the audience? Um, I always say um, we, we all get in our own gunfights, right? Mm-hmm. We always get in our, in our own gunfights, whether it's a real gunfight or you know a metaphorical gunfight. And when we're in those gunfights, that's all we can see. But that's not the big picture. Look up. Right? Don't, don't get buried in the gunfight reason. That's the only option. Look up, there's a much bigger picture. That's what I tell people. Just make sure that you understand there's bigger things that are that are eternal, not finite. Sound excellent. Well, thank you, Brian, for being on Beauty of Colors podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome.